Uh, well, uh, just to say something about the content of my presentation now, I'm not going to spend too much time on the uh, medical science, not least because I'm not uh, actually an epidemiologist myself. I want to focus more upon uh, what history can tell us about how pandemics like this arise uh, and what kind of effects they can have in the longer to medium term. So without any further ado, uh, let's put up the slides and I'll go through these uh, with the presentation. So, first of all, a few definitions. Uh, I don't need to say too much about these definitions, uh, except the one at the top, which is the important one, which is that epidemics are, by definition, uh, outbreaks of disease that have an initial pattern of uh, exponential growth. Now, that doesn't last forever. Eventually, the epidemic disease infects a sufficiently high proportion of the population that it can't spread anymore. But the initial pattern is always exponential, and that's what explains the uh, apparent very, very rapid growth from extremely small numbers to very, very large ones. As it says here, a pandemic technically means a global epidemic, but in practice, the word is used to describe any epidemic that spreads widely geographically outside its original point of origin. And there are two kinds of pandemics, basically. One is a pure epidemic pandemic, like the one we're experiencing at the moment. The other is something like HIV or cholera, uh, where the disease actually remains present on a constant basis for a prolonged period of time, but there, there are uh, repeated local outbreaks or upsurges of the disease. Now, we've had something like uh, 10 major pandemics in the last 300 years. I'm just going to run through uh, some of the ones that we've had in the last 100 years or so, the most significant ones. So we had so-called Russian flu in 1889 to 90, which killed at least a million people, probably more, uh, but we can't be quite sure about that. We then had the third global plague pandemic uh, after the Black Death and Justinian's plague, of which more in a moment, uh, in 1894 to 1922. Now, very fortunately, that did not get out of Eastern Asia. Uh, but it killed 10 million people in India, as you can see there. It killed about five or six million people in China uh, and an unknown number of people with a high proportion of the population in both Manchuria and Mongolia. So I think the world really did dodge a bullet there, uh, although the unfortunate East Asians didn't. You then had the one that people are remembering quite a lot now, the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918 to 1919. Now this killed at least 50 million people worldwide. Uh, it may actually have killed a lot more, but we can't be sure of actually how many people it killed because the bulk of the deaths took place in parts of the world like Africa, Latin America, parts of South Asia, where the record keeping for obvious reasons wasn't very good. Now, the fatality rate in developed countries of Spanish flu, Europe and North America, was about 0.5%. Uh, now, that is actually slightly less than what we think the fatality rate of the coronavirus is. Uh, so that puts that into some kind of comparison. However, when it got into parts of the world like Africa, the fatality rate was about 13%. And that's because, of course, the medical care wasn't as good uh, and the disease spread much more rapidly and much more widely than it did in even places like North America or Europe. The next big outbreak was 1957-58, so-called Asian flu, uh, which killed two to five million people worldwide. Uh, and then in 1968-69, we had so-called Hong Kong flu, uh, which took carried away one to four million people worldwide. Uh, that was about as severe uh, in terms of infectiousness as the one we have at the moment. Uh, then we had the most recent one before this current one, 2009-10, the swine flu epidemic. That killed 0.5 million people, so it was actually quite a mild illness, but it was very, very infectious, and it pretty much spread around the entire planet and infected something like 80% of the global population. Uh, now, those are all recent ones. The two really big pandemics, historically, uh, are these two. The first is the plague of Justinian, so-called, uh, so-called because it happened during his reign, uh, and 541 to 542 AD. 
Following that initial outbreak, there was a second outbreak a few years later, and then there were recurrent outbreaks of uh, this illness until the middle of the 8th century. This was almost certainly bubonic plague. The second big one is, of course, the one that we all know about, the Black Death, uh, which first breaks out in Hubei province in China, interestingly, in 1331, and then spreads right across the Eurasian landmass uh, until it reaches Western Europe and North Africa in 1347, and it then sweeps right through Europe and reaches uh, Northern Europe and Morocco in 1353. Following that, again, there are recurrent outbreaks of the plague until the mid-18th century, the last one in the British Isles, for example, being the famous Great Plague of London of 1665. Now, both of these pandemics killed about 40% of the populations that were affected, and they both significantly reduced global populations. So the Black Death reduced the world's population by about 30 to 40%, and it reduced the population of Eurasia by about 50%. So these are major demographic disasters. Uh, now, how to put the current pandemic into that kind of historical perspective. Uh, the problem is that the coronavirus does pose a very acute challenge for healthcare and for uh, public health. Usually, as it says at the start here, the infectiousness of an illness and the severity of the illness are inversely correlated. In other words, it's very unusual for a pathogen to be, caused, be both highly infectious and to cause severe symptoms or kill a lot of people. That's quite ob it's obvious the reason why that is. If the illness makes you so ill that you either die or lie at home and can't go out, you're not going to infect very many people before you die. If on the other hand, it's highly, you, it's mild, you're going to infect a lot of people because you're going to be freely going around and spreading the pathogen. So normally the two things don't go together. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 virus has a bad combination of both of them. Uh, it's highly infectious, about twice as infectious as the flu, which means that the time within which it spreads is going to be much, much shorter. And it also kills, as far as we can tell, anything from 0.4 to 1.6% of the people who get the infection. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually anything from 4 to 16 times more lethal than normal seasonal flu. Moreover, uh, it causes very severe symptoms in about 10 to 15 percent of the people who get it, so that about 10 percent of the people who get it require hospitalization, and that's the really big public health challenge. That's again significantly more, much higher proportion than in the case of regular seasonal flu. It's also not a classic flu virus. The coronavirus family to which this belongs is a different family of viruses. Uh, now what that means is there's a lot about it that we still don't know. And in particular we do not know if, like flu, it has seasonal effects. Uh, flu viruses are much less active in warm weather or in the summer, and that's why you always get an epidemic of flu in the autumn and winter, but it then goes away in late spring, summer. Now, if the coronavirus has a seasonal effect, we should expect the worst of this first wave of the epidemic to be over by the start of the summer. It will go away uh, quite clearly during the summer months. Uh, and then what would happen is we would almost certainly have a major second wave during the autumn and winter. However, if it doesn't have seasonal effects, uh, the bad news is that means it's going to continue throughout the summer and also spread very widely in hot parts of the world. Uh, but the good news is it means we're not going to have a major second wave. And at the moment, we have no real idea as to whether it, it's going to go down one route or the other. We will know that quite soon though. What we can be sure of is that it's probably going to be with us for 18 to 24 months. The only real question is whether there's one big peak or two. And as I say, we'll find that out quite soon. Now, the historical pattern for major pandemics is this. As it says at the top here of this slide, the spread of an epidemic is limited by two sets of factors. The first is the one I've already mentioned, the medical features of the disease. Typically, the more lethal the disease, the less likely it is to spread. So the SARS virus, for example, which was 
the subject of quite a serious lot of concern a few years ago, particularly in East Asia, that had a very high fatality rate. It killed between 20 and 30 percent of the people who caught it. That meant that it didn't spread very far and it was very easy to track and isolate the people who were carrying it. On the other hand, if the pathogen is highly infectious, it's going to spread very, very widely. But the other thing that determines the pattern of a pandemic is the social and economic structure of the part of the world where it originates or of the world as a whole. That's because uh, the more connected the world is, the more easy it is for a pathogen to spread around it. To take a kind of theoretical case, if you have a world where pretty much everyone lives in a self-sufficient household and they hardly ever see their neighbors who are all several miles away from them, uh, then no pathogen is ever going to really spread very far uh, because it just will be too difficult for it to find new hosts. On the other hand, the more urbanized society is, the more connected it is by trade, travel and movement of people, the farther and more rapidly the pandemic can spread. And one of the ways to think about a pandemic is that it's an epidemic that spreads to all parts of an ecumene. Now, an ecumene is essentially a part of the world which has a single division of labor. It's a large part of the world which is so closely economically uh, and culturally and politically very often connected, typically by trade and exchange, that there's an entire uh, economic division of labor and economic trade system within it. So the lands around the Mediterranean under the Roman Empire, for example, were an ecumene. Now, what a pandemic does is spread to every part of an ecumene, spread, as we'll see, typically by trade. So major pandemics uh, typically happen after a long period where there's been increased economic integration over a large part of the planet or the whole planet. Uh, that's because, of course, the trade and other links that are created by that process make the spread of an epidemic disease much easier. They spread along major trade routes. <clears throat> As we'll see in a moment, uh, every major pandemic in the past has tended to follow major trade and supply routes, both maritime and land-based. Highly connected cities are the initial foci for a pandemic. Whenever a pandemic starts up, the initial outbreak is typically not even. There are certain places which have much higher levels of infection than elsewhere. And those foci, those places of high infection, are typically highly connected uh, global trade hubs. Uh, also, by the way, major pilgrimage sites. That's the other classic uh, place for a high level of outbreaks. We can see this at the moment. So right now, for example, uh, cities that are particularly badly hit by uh, the pandemic, the coronavirus one, are places like Madrid, Milan, London, New York, Moscow, all of which are highly globally connected uh, cities. Now, one of the common reactions to this, which actually makes things worse in the long run, is to run away from the city to the countryside. You see this very much during the Black Death, for example, where everyone who could afford to, the elites and the aristocracy, uh, packed up their goods and packed up and went off to their country estates. That actually is not a smart move in the long run, because what it does is to actually disperse the pathogen, the disease-causing organism, more widely, so that when you get a second wave, which you normally do, it's more geographically dispersed and therefore more hard to deal with. Now, one of the things to say is that major epidemics typically involve a new pathogen. Uh, that's to say a mutated bacterium or virus to which human populations have limited or no immunity. Now, they originate, as it says here, in areas where the human world, either physically or metaphorically, is butting up against the natural world. That's because mutated pathogens typically arise in animals and then jump species and spread from animals to humans. So in the historic world, that typically means where the natural world comes up against a natural reservoir of some kind, uh, such as a large pool of rodents or something of that sort. In the modern world, it tends to mean the effects of modern intensive livestock farming, uh, which is an absolutely perfect breeding ground for novel pathogens. As you probably know in this case, 
uh, the place in which the natural world, if you like, butts up against the human world is wet markets in China, uh, where things like bats and pangolins uh, are bought and sold and then consumed. That appears to be the mechanism by which this particular virus got into the human um, population. And as I've said several times, uh, major pandemics come in waves, and it's usually the second wave that is the biggest and does uh, the most damage. Uh, we have to see if that is going to be the case uh, in this one. Now, here is uh, an example, a few examples of this. This is Justinian's plague. Uh, you'll, the grey area is the Byzantine Empire at the time of the plague, and the arrows, the dark arrows, are the root of the plague in the first wave. Uh, the dotted lines are the second wave, and you'll notice how the second wave spreads out of Constantinople, which is actually a place to get it rather late in the first wave. And you'll see how, from the arrows, how it spreads all around the Mediterranean in a matter of just a year and a half. Here's another map of Justinian's plague. You'll notice that the uh, historians are pretty sure now that it originates on the savannah of East Africa uh, in the rodent population there, spreads from there to the port cities of the Swahili coast, and then sweeps up the, Medi up the Red Sea to Alexandria and Pelusium, from where it spreads all over the Mediterranean. Uh, hits Constantinople in two waves, by the way, and in the second wave, it takes off something like 40% of the population of the city. Here's the Black Death. We are pretty sure again now that it originates in northeast Burma in the tropical rainforest there. It then gets into China and breaks out for the first time here in Hubei province in the center of China in 1331. And the red arrows show how the plague is then spread by a combination of merchant caravans and the Mongol armies of the great Mongol empire right across Eurasia. It also spreads through these other trade routes that you can see here into the Delhi Sultanate, into Southeast Asia uh, and down the east coast of Africa. So that it, by the time it comes to the end of its spread, it's affected almost the whole uh, of the old world. Uh, but again, the correlation between the spread of the illness and that of major trade routes is very, very clear. Here's Spanish flu. Uh, despite its name, this actually originates in Kansas. Uh, and so the initial foci of the outbreak, which I don't know if you can see that there, these red squares are here in the United States. Uh, and what then happens is it spreads to Europe and to other parts of the world. Now you'll notice the spread is much, much more rapid than it was in the case of the Black Death. That took nearly 30 years to make its way across Eurasia, whereas here you'll see it arrives in Cape Town, South Africa, six months after it is first detected in the United States. It arrives in Paris five months after it's first detected in the United States. That, of course, reflects the greater speed of travel with things like the steamship, uh, as compared to the Middle Ages. The blue arrows on this chart are the second wave, which you'll see is slightly different from the pattern of the first wave. But again, it's the second wave that makes it more uh, widespread. Notice that Latin America uh, dodges a bullet, really. It doesn't have much of an impact down there. Here's a bullet we dodged. Uh, this is a pandemic we could have had a few years ago, uh, but managed to escape thanks to effective action by mainly the Nigerian government. This was the Ebola outbreak. Now, Ebola would not have been as far reaching in many ways as the current COVID-19 pandemic is because the Ebola virus is very deadly. And so that would have limited its spread. Even so, it would have been a real disaster had it got out of Africa. Uh, the dotted line on that map there is the natural range of the fruit bat, which was the uh, animal reservoir for the Ebola virus. So that's the part of the world that probably would have been really badly affected had the Nigerian government not actually stepped up to the place and done a great job of containing the spread out of uh, West Africa. Now, what about the results of major pandemics? Well, the results can often be very slight. Those pandemics in the uh, earlier 20th century, the Asian flu and Hong Kong flu epidemics, uh, they did have some impact, which I'll say more about in a moment, but not that much. And that's partly to do with the severity of it. Obviously, the more severe the outbreak is in terms of the number of people it kills, uh, the more the impact. But the other thing that determines the results is the political and socio-cultural reaction. Very often it's the reaction to a pandemic uh, which has, has as much as an effect as the pandemic itself. And in fact, apart from the 
couple of major ones, the two big bubonic plague ones I described, the mortality is actually not the most important result uh, because say the mortality of the Spanish flu in 1918 to 19, uh, sure it killed 50 million people, but in terms of the global population, that was actually not that much of an impact, but it did have a big impact in terms of the politics and the culture. Now, what you find is that if a pandemic does have a major impact, it doesn't typically create something totally novel. What it usually does is to accelerate and intensify things that were already happening, pre-existing trends. Uh, and that's the thing to bear in mind when thinking about what the impact of the coronavirus is likely to be. What they do have very often is major intellectual and cultural effects, but these are much less predictable than the economic or political ones. And the way to think of a pandemic, as it says here, is that it's a stress test. Uh, what it does is to reveal which social, uh, political and economic institutions are resilient and adaptable and which ones are brittle and fragile. Uh, one of the things we are going to discover, I am certain, from this experience is that quite a lot of the economic institutions we have are highly efficient, that's to say they maximise output, but then also excessively complex and therefore uh, fragile and brittle. Uh, for example, I certainly didn't realise, and I think most people didn't realise, that virtually all of the world's condoms come from just one manufacturer uh, in one specific place on the planet. Uh, that makes the whole supply of the good, in this case, uh, prophylactic contraceptives highly susceptible to interruption in the event of a major global emergency of this kind. Uh, it may be more efficient to only have one specialised producer, but that makes the whole system much less resilient. And I think that's something we're going to find in a number of areas, not just there. So let's run through some of the impacts quickly here. Uh, first of all, the most obvious thing is about the economic impact. What we are experiencing at the moment is a massive supply side shock. In other words, a huge reduction in the actual output of goods and services. Now, this is in historic cases, this has been brought about by an awful lot of people dying. So the Black Death was a huge supply side shock for late medieval Europe because it killed off half the population. Now that's not the case here. The supply side shock has actually been deliberately induced by governments to the measures they have taken to control the spread of the pandemic. Uh, personally, I think they're uh, justified in doing that. Uh, others may disagree, but regardless of whether you think it's justified or not, it's important to understand that that is what is happening. Basically, the whole supply side of the economy is taking an enormous hit in order to prevent the spread of the illness. Now, what that means is we are dealing with supply side recession or slump and not a demand led one. Uh, this is a kind of slump that would have been very familiar to our ancestors, but it's not been so common in the last hundred years. Now, the physical assets, the pubs, for example, or the restaurants or the factories and the offices, they're still there. But what makes those physical assets productive is the human infrastructure associated with them, the economic relationships, the firms, the contracts, the various agreements and arrangements that people make. And the danger is that those social relations that make those physical assets productive are going to be eroded by the shutdown. Uh, and it will be then very difficult and very expensive uh, to rebuild them. Now, what the government is trying to do essentially uh, around the world, not just in Britain, is to preserve that supply side uh, relation. So things like the subsidy to wage bills is not about maintaining demand, it's about maintaining the supply side of the economy. Now if this works there will be a very severe slowdown but it will be short-lived. What about the other things? Well it will certainly accelerate certain previous trends so we may indeed see a major increase in home working. That would not surprise me. Uh, on the other hand, people may decide that they actually hate being at home and want to go into the office. Uh, companies, though, may well discover that they just don't need as much office space as they needed uh, and they, they can get by with much less. So that may well be a trend which is significantly accelerated. It will also lead to some pretty striking innovation. I'm pretty sure that online shopping, online technology, 
all kinds of uh, electronic services are going to see all sorts of innovation during this. So that's the, if you like, the good outcome of the impact here. So some parts of the economy will be permanently reduced or transformed and others will grow. Now, you don't want to stop this process of adaptation because in many ways, it's giving a push to innovative trends that were already in place. Uh, so there's a kind of very tricky balance to strike between trying to keep the supply side of the economy in working order, but not wanting to stand in the way of the actual productive innovations uh, that the whole process will bring. So it's, as I said, it's very likely that there will be a sharp rebound. Uh, if things work out, what we should see is a very big decline in GDP in the first and second quarters of this year, but then hopefully a very strong uh, reaction after that. In fact, way above average trend growth for the next two or three quarters after that. However, that does need to be qualified. What this is very likely to lead to and what major pandemics have led to in the past is a sharp correction in asset values. Now, historically, for example, the Black Death led to a huge collapse in the value of land. Uh, quite a lot of uh, certain kinds of economic uh, goods were significantly devalued after the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918-19. In this case, quite a lot of uh, assets are going to lose a lot of their values. And so a lot of paper wealth, if you like, is going to be wiped out by this, not least because I think that this uh, pandemic has triggered off a large correction in asset values, which is probably going to happen anyway, uh, and has given it made it even larger than it would have been otherwise. In particular, I think we're going to see a lot of debt being written off because a lot of debt is going to prove to be quite simply uh, unserviceable, never mind unrepayable. And so effectively, it will become worthless. And I think that later on this year, probably in the spring of next year, we're going to see some pretty widespread measures of debt forgiveness, uh, partly by necessity, partly perhaps as an act of policy. And generally speaking, major epidemics are bad news for the wealthy uh, because what they tend to do is to hit the wealth of the affluent in the longer run more than they do the wealth of the average or the poor people or the poor. Uh, we can see this historically very strongly and I think probably the same pattern is going to happen this time. Uh, one's reminded of the work of Walter Scheidel that it's actually major disasters that tend to do the most to promote equality. Uh, and what I think it will do is expose the fragility of quite a lot of the current financial system, uh, the degree to which uh, it's not able to cope with sudden major interruptions to things like uh, cash and monetary flows through the economy uh, due to a combination of the impact of the virus itself and the impact of the measures taken by governments to contain it. Uh, what is much more disturbing, and this is the result I, I'm particularly concerned about, is that historically, as it says here, big pandemics have arrested or reversed economic integration. And it's likely to happen this time. So I think this is likely to give a big boost to economic nationalism, to protectionism, uh, and also lead to a quite significant decline in economic integration. It will lead, I think, to a significant shortening of supply chains, uh, a lot of people will decide that they don't want to be so dependent upon supply chains that because of their uh, geographical extent are very susceptible to disruption. Plus politically, I suspect this is going to lead to a major growth in nationalism and quite a crisis for uh, transnational and supranational institutions. Uh, I don't think the EU is covering itself with glory at the moment, to put it mildly. And the reaction to this in a number of countries such as Italy is likely to be very hostile. Uh, this is an acceleration of pre-existing trends. These were all things that were happening anyway, but I think they're going to get a very big boost. Uh, it's going to accelerate the realignment and transformation of the right away from free markets. We can see this already in this country. I think it's happening in other countries as well. The centre right of politics is going to move much more towards uh, interventionist economic nationalism uh, combined with a kind of uh, private but state nudged or directed economy. Uh, we're also, on the other hand, going to see in the aftermath of this, the consolidation of a liberal and free market alternative. The big argument is going to come in about two years 
or 18 months over whether or not to continue the policy changes that have been brought in as an emergency measure, because lots of people will argue that these should remain in place, just as they did during World War II and after World War II with the measures that have been taken for fighting the war. And so that's when I think the big argument is going to happen. We're probably going to see a revival of state ownership of key sectors, but also at the same time, a decline in regulation. Uh, and one of the things that this crisis is showing up is just how many daft regulations there are out there that people probably uh, don't want to have anyway. And I suspect that actually that's the one of the few bright uh, sparks in this whole uh, scenario. Uh, particularly in the UK and the US, I think there are going to be some major welfare reforms because I think that the current welfare system, uh, with its dependence upon means-tested income supplement benefits, is going to be found to be just not up to the job. Now, I have no idea what is going to happen, though. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, argument now that we should move to a universal basic income, but there will be significant resistance to that from both ends of the political spectrum. So we may end up with something else, maybe a universal basic service model, or maybe a revival of the beverage model of social insurance. What I am sure of is that we're going to have a big debate about welfare policy in the next 18 months. Historically, there are two different cultural effects from uh, a pandemic. One of them is a decline in intellectual frivolity of all kinds and a move to seriousness. People start to think, look, good Lord, life is just too serious. You could die at any minute. Time to forget about all this silly stuff that the intellectuals care about and focus on what matters. So you do get a lot of that. Historically, that tended to mean a revival of religious belief. Uh, but it probably, it may well mean that this time, actually, but it often will mean other things, obviously. But I think that's one of the common reactions. But on the other hand, what you also find, often in the same people, is a move towards a very hedonistic living for the day kind of approach on the feeling, well, if I'm going to die at any moment, or if life is actually much more risky than I thought it was, I should just do what I want to do and not hesitate for it. And so you get these two contrasting uh, reactions to major uh, crises of this kind, major natural disasters in general, in fact. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things to think is, this could be a lot worse. Uh, we're very lucky that this is a viral pandemic. The real nightmare would be, as it says here, a pandemic caused by a bacterial pathogen uh, that was resistant by antibiotics. That way we really could have another rerun of the Black Death. Fortunately, that's a low probability, very low. But sooner or later, we'll have another pandemic. As I said, there have been 10 pandemics in the last 300 years. There have been five or six in the last 100 years. They're a regular feature of the modern world. Even a serious flu like the Hong Kong flu or the East Asian flu is a bad thing to happen because typically that reduces global GDP by about 0.7% in a year. Sooner or later, we will have a really bad pandemic. We sh this is, in a way is a bit like a warning shot. Uh, we may well have another epidemic like this uh, at some point in the future. We, we don't know exactly when, though. But what we can say is that several features of the way we live now make a major pandemic much more likely than would otherwise be the case. And in particular, I would point to contemporary intensive livestock farming, something I've already mentioned. This is a major source of novel pathogens. Another major source is pressure on wildlife habitats uh, and the eating of uh, wild animals uh, or exotic meat, as it's called, uh, which is another major route for novel pathogens to enter the human population. Finally, uh, when thinking about future risks of pandemics, we should not succumb to the bathtub fallacy. Uh, that's the fallacy that you should worry more about uh, slipping over in your bathtub uh, than, say, a terrorist attack or a pandemic, because the chances that you'll fall in your bathtub and break your arm are much higher than the chances of you're being killed by a pandemic uh, illness. Uh, it does not make sense to think of uh, low harm but high probability events in the same way as low probability events that bring massive damage. Uh, that is something that you should worry about and so this is a risk that we should be worried about going forward. So at that point I'll stop.